This is the first of eight video lectures on Plato's Republic. Um, the second longest dialogue of all of Plato's works. The Republic is a text that covers essentially the whole of philosophy. Um, ethics, it covers political philosophy, it covers aesthetics, metaphysics, epistemology, everything, essentially. It's a dialogue that concerns, is motivated by the question, not simply what is justice, but why or whether one ought to be just, whether there is reason to be just. It's a dialogue that many think as being the kind of first philosophical utopian uh, work. But there are also many elements within this dialogue that question to what extent it is utopian, or even maybe what it means to be utopian. There's a whole kind of meta-critique we could think about when we read Plato's Republic of, of the dialogue itself. A lot of this, I think, can be found in the opening words of the Republic. The Republic takes place, the setting uh, in the, the, the text, of Socrates walking back from the Piraeus. The Piraeus was this uh, port area. There were a lot of uh, merchants, foreigners um, on, on the outskirts kind of, of, of the city of Athens. And so there's a lot going on in, in the Piraeus, Piraeus. Why would Socrates begin this dialogue on the question, what is justice, whether... Uh, one should be just or not, whether one ought to be. Why does he begin it with Socrates mentioning he went down to the Piraeus? Um, I'll, I'll read the, the opening words here to uh, the Republic. He says, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pray to the goddess. And at the same time, I wanted to observe how they would put on the festival, since they were now holding it for the first time. Now, in my opinion, the procession of the native inhabitants was fine, but the one the Thracians conducted was no less fitting a show. After we had prayed and looked on, we went off toward town. So, the, the, the Piraeus here, right, putting on a new festival for the first time. I think one of the, the questions implied in um, this opening line is, what would it be like to put on something wholly new for, for the first time? Is it indebted in any way to the past? Do our past experiences, our, our present characteristics, um, do they influence how we put on something new for the first time? Or can we think of something entirely new, ex nihilo, right? Um, to this extent, then, we're thinking about ideal. If I want to think about what ideal justice is, can I think about it completely in the abstract, uh, devoid of any interests I have now or any uh, past experiences I might have which might motivate my concerns in asking what is justice? Or is it implicated by that? There's a lot more that concerns um, how we read the Republic than just this opening line, even though it gives us a view into maybe how to read the Republic. The Republic is actually the name given to um, th th this work by the Romans. Uh, its original name actually in Greek is, is translated literally as Constitution. And so you can think of Constitution, the relation to the Roman Republic, the Constitution of Rome. But Constitution refers not just to a political constitution, the document of the essence of the working, of the soul perhaps, uh, of a city or a government, of a political body, but also we can think of constitution of the soul, of the, the character of each individual. And that is going to correspond to, later on in the Republic we'll see um, the relation drawn by Socrates between the city and the soul, the city-soul analogy. We have to be familiar with the major characters of the dialogue. Now, of course, there is Socrates, but there is also uh, uh, Polemarchus, who is the son of Cephalus. Cephalus is, in the dialogue at this point, a very old man. 
But he uh, was known for basically running a mine that employed a lot of slaves, and he would exploit these slaves. Um, many of them would die, and so he was kind of looked down upon uh, by others, not just Athenians, but, but others settling uh, around Athens because of his harsh uh, uh, work that he employed on, on those slaves that made Cephalus extremely wealthy. Polemarchus then, as we'll see, in some ways it's going to be a concern for Polemarchus carrying this burden of the life that Cephalus has led. There's also Glaucon. Glaucon is actually the older brother of Plato, as well as Adamantus is also Plato's brother. Um, it's really interesting because Glaucon seems to have been a well-known warrior, um, an eager person to learn, but also, if records are correct, it seems Glaucon got caught up in uh, what was the thirty, the reign of the thirty tyrants, this kind of oligarchy that took over Athens, and actually had Polemarchus sentenced to death. In fact, when they did that, they did not allow his body uh, the, the, to, to undergo a funeral in his home, which was the custom. They denied, the 30 tyrants denied that of Polemarchus and his family. And that's actually where the setting of the dialogue takes place, is in Polemarchus' home then. Why would that be? Is it to give a funeral for Polemarchus? And why is Glaucon such a central figure Later on, really, you know, from book two on, uh, why is he such a central figure in the dialogue? Is Plato writing to try and maybe save Glaucon's soul, to convince him he should be just, even though in real life it turned out perhaps he was not by uh, being involved with the 30 tyrants? There's also the character that has the main role in the second half of the first book, Thrasymachus, a sophist. Thrasymachus is going to famously argue justice is the advantage of the stronger. So we have to think about the role he might play in the dialogue. We also have to think about, you know, this is a fictional dialogue. What role does Plato play? Is he a character? Is he an indirect character? character then, writing, constructing the way each character behaves, what they say, when they say, why they say it, how the dialogue proceeds. We want to also think about the mimetic structure of the dialogue. Mimesis, Greek word for imitation. We want to think about how imitation uh, works in the Republic. And I say this because you'll notice in the Republic it's a bit different from other Platonic dialogues where you have the different characters where it'll have Socrates speaks and then maybe Glaucon or whoever else. But all of this is actually recounted by Socrates. Socrates is actually supposedly retelling the story a day later. So he ends up speaking for everyone. Socrates speaks for Polemarchus, he speaks for Cephalus, Glaucon, Adamantus, Thrasymachus, and then he speaks for himself. And then, of course, Plato, in writing this dialogue, Plato is speaking for Socrates, who is speaking for all these different characters. We might even then go further and ask, okay, so if we have this kind of imitation that Plato is doing by having, uh, by, by writing, you know, for Socrates and so on, and then Socrates uh, uh, speaking for himself and Paul Marcus and all those other characters and so on, what about the reader? What role might the reader play interactively in, in reading out the dialogue and interpreting what they're saying? Is there a kind of imitation that's undergoing in the soul of the reader? And that's going to be very important because imitation is going to be one of the things that Socrates famously is going to criticize. Finally, we should think about the role of Elenchus. Now, famously, like with uh, uh, the Euthyphro, um, you have the Socratic method that is undergone where Socrates is going to question Euthyphro as to what uh, piety is. And through this kind of method of negative questioning, the idea is to hopefully work out the truth of the object under question of you know the essence or nature of piety. In this case, the question is, what is justice? But it's thought that, you know, most of the time in the Socratic method, the dialogue ends in aporia, in an impasse. 
But it's thought that there is no impasse, at least not explicitly, in the dialogue of the Republic. But so we want to keep in mind this idea of the method of Elenchus. We want to keep in mind the concept of operia and whether the dialogue does end in operia or if it does maybe in what way that might be different from other dialogues and why. And I'm asking that for, you know, pedagogically. Why does or why might it end pedagogically in operia or in operia for whom? So returning back to the dialogue in the very beginning, um, Socrates and Glaucon are walking, and as they're walking, uh, he mentions that Polemarchus and his friends, uh, friends catch sight of him. Um, and basically, he said, well, we have this first image actually of something that's talked about in many other dialogues, right? Catching sight of. There's first this moment of the senses experiencing something and then trying to discern from there catching sight of us from afar as we were pressing homewards, Paul Marcus does. He asks one of his uh, uh, servant boys to run up to Socrates and, and basically says, Paul Marcus commands you to wait for him to catch up because he wants to talk to you. That's very strange, right? Would you normally command a friend to wait or would you ask? So already there's a kind of dynamic, and a power dynamic that we have to read into the dialogue. How might that power dynamic condition the way that a hopefully free exchange of ideas might proceed? Now, you know, Paul Marcus, eventually Socrates is like, well, you know, I was going to leave. And he basically says, well, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. And Socrates is like, interesting, you say prove stronger. But isn't there another possibility of persuading, maybe through the stronger persuasion, that you can let us go? So already then we're thinking about, well, strength in terms of physical bodies, and then strength in terms of maybe rhetoric or even reason. Could you really persuade us, Polymarchus responds, if we don't listen? So we have to think about the dialogue. It, it, it wants to inquire into the nature of justice. And Socrates is going to try and convince everyone why uh, they should be just. So think about that in light of Paul Marcus saying, or asking, to Socrates, could you really persuade us if we don't listen? How do you educate someone if they're refusing to listen? Is it possible? Are there ways maybe you can, I don't know, maybe trick them, use a noble lie, as we'll see later on um, in, the, in, in the Republic? And so, well then, think it over, bear in mind, we won't listen again, uh, Paul Marcus says. What's interesting is how the actual discussion into justice is conditioned is at the end when they're talking, right? And Paul Marcus is saying, well, what if we don't listen? How are you going to persuade us? And Socrates eventually says, well, if it is so resolved, that's how we must act. And a literal translation is, well, if it is indeed, then that's how we must carry on, right? Indeed, right? If it is, if it has been uh, uh, ruled in such a way, basically a, a kind of political agreement, then that is how we must act. So what conditions the later discussion of ideal justice is a political setting, a political agreement, how might then we think about to what extent this is ideal justice being discussed in the Republic or what it might mean to be ideal in this context? At this point in the dialogue, um, Cephalus, Paul Marcus's father, enters the, the, the conversation. And Socrates wants to know, you know, you are um, an older individual. Surely then with age comes wisdom, and you can enlighten us then, you know, what is a virtuous life? Um, what can you tell us about being older now? And some of the questions are, right, is a virtuous life consist in uh, pleasure? That, you know, a, a, a one who wants to be virtuous is going to maximize their pleasure, things that make them happy? Is it going to be the accumulation of wealth? And certainly Cephalus 
has accumulated wealth. He's a wealthy individual. Or is there some other higher purpose? And Kevlis basically says, well, it's actually very interesting because as you get older, you start to uh, learn that you don't have to rely so much on the senses. In fact, the senses become a burden. So we kind of get this argument against uh, vir a virtuous life being uh, consisting of pleasure. There are all other kinds of things one takes into account, Kefalus says, that for in every way, old age brings great peace and freedom from sexual and other bodily desires. When the desires cease to strain and finally, finally relax, then what Sophocles says comes to pass in every way. For it is possible to be rid of very many mad masters, the different masters, we might say, of the different um, senses, um, kind of tempting uh, reason, controlling reason, maybe. But of these things and of those that concern relatives, there is one just cause, not old age, Socrates, but the character of human beings. If they are orderly and content with themselves, even old age is only moderately troublesome. If they are not, then both age, Socrates, and youth alike turn out to be hard for that sort. Now, it's very interesting because you might interpret this as Kefala is trying to convince younger individuals, don't worry so much about maximizing pleasure when you're young. Think about um, trying to uh, prudently control your desires. Be in control of them. And there is something to be learned from that, definitely. But readers of the dialogue, contemporaries of Plato, would have known the character Kephalus. And they would have known, perhaps he's mentioning this because he's worried for his own soul. Because of the unjust deeds he has done, the things he's done in exploiting human beings to maximize his wealth. He's also probably mentioning this because he's worried how might his actions lead to consequences for his son, Polemarchus. As we know, historically, right? Because of uh, uh, how Cephalus lived, the 30 tyrants came after Polemarchus and killed him. Socrates responds then to uh, what Cephalus says here. Okay, 329e, he says... Socrates says, Then I was full of wonder what he said, and wanting him to say still more, I stirred him up, saying, Cephalus, when you say these things, I suppose that the many do not accept them from you, but believe rather that it is not due to character that you bear old age so easily. And is he bearing old age so easily in appearance or in his soul? But due to possessing great substance. They say that for the rich... There are many consolations. So, does wealth, then, enable Cephalus to carry out in his old age a life of ease, of, of comfort, of not worrying? In appearance, it seems like, yes, of course, wealth allows one to live uh, more comfortably. But how has that affected his soul now that Cephalus is close to uh, uh, death? He's, he's very old. Can wealth save his soul? In, in essence, is the question here that Socrates is asking. Kephalus then says, well, I don't know how to answer you, Socrates, but what I will do is I will let my son inherit this uh, uh, question. And then Kephalus leaves. Polemarchus then takes up this question, and Polemarchus says, well, what I can tell you, Socrates, what I've heard is that it is just to give each to each what is owed, that we think about, well, it's fair that whatever one is owed, right, that's what they receive, and if they're owed something and don't receive it, then it's unjust. It seems like a very common sense view of justice. What exactly does this mean? Well, then justice consists in doing good to friends and harm to enemies because we owe good things to our friends because that's what it means to be a friend. We care for them. We want to be for the, there for them when they're in trouble. We want to help them succeed as human beings and, and better themselves to excel in life. Those who are enemies, 
right? We then want to not do what we do as friends because as friends, we want to help them. We want to do good to them. As enemies then, Paul Marcus says, we actually want to harm them because that's what it means to be an enemy. We want to harm you, to stop you, to make you worse. That's what's owed to you as an enemy. So the question arises, who's most able to do good to friends and harm to enemies? Is it the just or the unjust person? And it appears, well, it's actually going to be the just person that is most able to do good to friends and harm to enemies. But that also means the just person wields with them the power to do harm. So justice, if not used properly, can turn into injustice. It, it, it seems, at least, perhaps. So justice, then, seems, according to you and Homer and Simonides, Socrates says, to be a certain art of stealing for the benefit, to be sure, of friends and the harm of enemies. And there's something uneasy to think about that, that justice then, if it's to give to each what is owed, and what is owed to, of course, friends is good things, and enemies bad things, then it seems there's a certain kind of power in justice that if, you know, it can be used to do extreme harm. And that seems odd, that it seems like, well, actually what concerns justice or what makes justice uh, good is the right use of justice and not justice itself. When we think about the idea that it's just to give to each what is owed, Socrates ends up responding to Paul Marcus, asking him, well, wouldn't you admit that, uh, let's say I borrow a weapon, and I end up, uh, uh, I borrow a weapon from you, okay? And you end up getting mad later on at somebody else, and you turn to me, and you're like, you know what? That's my weapon that I lent to you. It's just that you give it back to me. I need it because I'm about to go kill this person that's pissing me off. Would we say it's just to give to our friend that weapon, that weapon back to them so they can go and kill that other individual because they're really pissed? Right? Socrates wants to say, well, wouldn't you admit that when someone is not in their right mind, that's an instance where we don't give that thing that's owed to them back. That we would say, well, in that case, I might end up harming my friend by giving him the weapon if he's not in his right mind. So it can't be the case, then, that uh, uh, it is just to give to each what is owed. Because in some cases, someone might be owed something, but it would be unjust to give it back to them. But let's say uh, this is the case. That... Justice is to do good things to friends and, and harm to enemies. Socrates asks, how can you be sure that your friends are actually friends? This leads us to our first encounter with the appearance-essence distinction that's made in the Republic. We don't want to fall for the appearances of things, right? We might see people and how they behave, and they might have lots of money, and they might give to charity and things like that, and it might seem like these are just individuals. But just because they appear a certain way doesn't mean, in essence, it is in their nature that they are a just individual. So we want to know the essence. We want to know the nature of individuals, their souls. And just in the same way that we want to know the nature of justice, the definition of what justice actually is in its essence, and not just how it appears in how people behave. So how can we resolve this argument? Well, you know, we're going to have to inquire into how we come to know things, right? This is our first then encounter as well into epistemology. So the friend who appears good and is actually good is a friend, Socrates says. The friend who appears good but is bad is actually an enemy, we can say. Now, the question then is how to discern that when one appears good, they actually are good. So we can say that a priori, that well, what it means to be a good person is to then have a good soul and not just appear good to other individuals. The question is, how are we able to discern that? How are we able to discern who the enemy is and who the friend is? There's also a further question. If we say that it is just to do good to friends and harm to enemies. What does harming someone actually do? 
Does it make them more virtuous? Or does it actually make them a worse person? Do you, do you end up corrupting, hurting their soul to harm the enemy? And wouldn't that make them more of a ferocious enemy? Someone worse? Someone who's going to hurt you more? So it doesn't seem actually like it would be just to harm enemies because you are going to make them more unjust. And unjust people do unjust deeds. It hurts you as well. I mean, think about it. Let's say we have criminals, okay, in, in our society. Is the correct thing to try and improve their character, to make them good people and not be criminals, or is it to harm their character, to hurt their soul, to make them more corrupt as punishment? No, because then you're just going to have even worse criminals that are going to hurt you. So, Socrates says, then it is not the work of the just man to harm either a friend or anyone else, Polemarchus, but of his opposite, the unjust man. Then Thrasymachus jumps into the argument. And Thrasymachus, kind of uh, uh, taking over the conversation, says, I say that the just is nothing other than the advantage or the interest of the stronger. You might think at first, that sounds a bit weird. Why would you say it's the advantage or the interest of the stronger? But there are quite a few reasons why one might say exactly this. Think about laws, right? We obey laws. Why? Most likely because we're going to be punished, right? We obey someone if they threaten us and we think that they can actually harm us and we can't do anything to stop them from harming us. So when we think about justice or you know the law a, or a government, carrying out what they say is justice, they're doing so because they have the power to do so. This is going to lead us into a question over describing justice in perhaps we could say a non-ideal world, in, in the world we inhabit, versus a normative account or description of justice. Because we might even admit so uh, that Thrasymachus is correct, that justice is the advantage of the stronger. At least that's, again, how it appears. But what is justice really? How ought we uh, behave to be just? Or how should justice be? Or how should a just government or a just ruler conduct themselves? And Socrates basically gets Thrasymachus to see there's a kind of contradiction in his own argument. Because basically, um, trying to interpret Socrates, he basically says, well, if beef is advantageous to Mark, and we could say Mark is really strong, so we might want to say, well, then justice is, beef, uh, is Mark eating beef. What about Timmy? Timmy is someone weak, okay, not strong. And yet, wouldn't we grant that it is also advantageous to Timmy for him to eat beef? It's going to make Timmy stronger. It's going to make Timmy uh, healthier, right? He's going to get nutrition, so in that case, Thrasymachus would have to admit, actually, it is, in this case, advantageous to uh, uh, Timothy, to Timmy to eat beef, just as it is advantageous to Mark to eat beef. And it seems like in this case, then, well, in some cases, it's just for someone who is weaker to uh, uh, get what is to their advantage because it helps them as well. It doesn't just help the one that's stronger. There are instances where it can help the weaker as well. So there are some cases where a law, right? We might say, well, uh, following the law is just because it's for the advantage of the ruler. But wouldn't it be to the advantage of someone who's not a ruler, but yet the law is enforced such that when someone you know, steals from me, they get punished. Doesn't that also benefit me as a non-ruler, as just a citizen? So Thrasymachus um, redefines his argument, and now he says, well, justice is obeying laws and customs that benefit the established ruling body. So even if someone, you know, benefits who's weaker, uh, or that's not the established ruling body, it doesn't matter. That's, you know, something else. Maybe it's nice that that happens. But specifically, justice is that which benefits the established ruling body. And Socrates asks, do rulers always do what is in their best interest? Can it be the case that rulers oftentimes are idiots? They end up doing bad things, things that end up undermining their rule 
or things that cause others to notice a weakness in what they're doing and basically uh, 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 do a coup and overtake the government. So Thrasymachus responds to that saying, well, basically, we only know that to be the case if a ruler commits a mistake, if an expert determines they committed a mistake. So he says, no craftsman, craftsman, wise man, or ruler makes mistakes at the moment when he's ruling. Although everyone would say that the doctor made a mistake and the ruler made a mistake. The difference Thrasymachus wants to say there is it's only the ruler who can determine when a mistake is made. So then the onus gets put back on you know, the ruler in the same way that it, only a doctor can determine when uh, a doctor has made, made a mistake because it deals with the art or the craft or the science of being a doctor. In the same way that only a ruler can determine when a ruler makes a mistake because it deals with the art of ruling. So even then, it's rulers who determine when mistakes are made or when a ruler shouldn't do what a ruler ought to do. But no matter what, it's always then in the interest of the ruler. So Socrates responds to that by saying, yes, but wouldn't you admit that experts work for the good of the object they work on, not for the sake of the art? So in the case of a doctor, it's not the case that the doctor says um, a mistake is made or not made for the sake of the, 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 the art or science of, of doctoring. They say it for the sake of the patient. Isn't it the case that a ruler, right, when a mistake is made, it's a mistake that's made because it harms those over whom they rule, not the art of ruling. And, and, and a ruler rules because they're looking over a, a political body. And then in the same way, it's the case for a sailor who actually, they work for the sake of the crew so the boat doesn't sink and they get the crew from uh, uh, one destination or, or from one uh, uh, place to their destination. And the sailor doesn't work solely for the art of sailing itself. So in that case, Socrates says, justice concerns the advantage of the weaker. If we say the crew the members of a boat are the weaker compared to the sailor. Citizens are the weaker in comparison to the ruler. And the patient is weaker in comparison to the doctor. That when we do an art or a craft well, it's for the sake of the object, not for the sake of the craft. Then the craft is indirectly improved, but only because they improve their object, which is the sake of the craft. So in that case, it can't be that justice is obeying laws or customs that benefit the established ruling body because what benefits the established ruling body is benefiting the weaker, the citizens, over whom they rule over. So then again, Thrasymachus uh, revises his argument. And now he says that justice benefits others while injustice benefits oneself. Therefore, he says, it is better to be unjust than just. So let me read specifically from uh, what he says here. Okay, so Thrasymachus says, And you are so far off about the just and justice, and the unjust and injustice, that you are unaware that justice and the just are really someone else's good. The advantage of the man who is stronger and rules, and a personal harm to the man who obeys and serves. Injustice is the opposite, and it rules the truly simple and just, and those who are ruled do what is advantageous for him who is stronger, and they make him whom they serve happy, but themselves not at all. And this must be considered, most simple Socrates. The just man everywhere has less than the unjust man. So now he wants to say, look, I'm going to actually redefine what justice and injustice are, because what concerns me as a sophist is the stronger. And now I'm going to say, if you look at those who are unjust, they benefit from being unjust. So it's good to be unjust. It's ad advantageous to be unjust. Those who obey justice, they get trampled over. They get walked all over. 
And it's actually not beneficial for them to be just. So he says, first, in contracts, when the just man is a partner of the unjust man, you will always find that at the dissolution of the partnership, the just man does not have more than the unjust man, but less. Second, in matters pertaining to the city, when there are taxes, the just man pays more on the basis of equal property, the unjust man less. And when there are distributions, the, ones, the one makes no profit, the other much. And further, when each holds some ruling office, even if the just man suffers no other penalty, it is his lot to see his domestic affairs deteriorate from neglect. While he gets no advantage from the public store, thanks to his being just, in addition to this, he incurs the ill will of his relatives and his acquaintances when he is unwilling to serve them against what is just. The unjust man's situation is the opposite in all of these respects. I am speaking of the man I just now spoke of, of the one who is able to get the better in a big way. Consider him. If you want to judge how much more to his private advantage the unjust is than the just, you will learn most easily of all if you turn to the most, per most perfect injustice, which makes the one who does injustice most happy, and those who suffer it, and who would not be willing to do injustice most wretched. And that is tyranny, which by stealth and force takes away what belongs to others, both what is sacred and profane, private and public, not bit by bit, but all at once. When someone does some part of this injustice and doesn't get away with it, he is punished and endures the greatest reproaches, temple robbers, kidnappers, housebreakers, defrauders, and thieves are what they call those partially unjust men who do such evil deeds. But when someone, in addition to the money of the citizens, kidnaps and enslaves them too, instead of these same shameful names, he gets called happy and blessed, not only by the citizens, but also by whomever else hears that he has done injustice entire. For it is not because they fear doing unjust deeds, but because they fear suffering them. So he's saying, well, the reason that people fear doing injustice is because they just fear the punishment. That those who blame injustice do so. So, Socrates, injustice, when it comes into being on a sufficient scale, is mightier, freer, and more masterful than justice. And as I have said from the beginning, the just is the advantage of the stronger, and the unjust is what is profitable and advantageous for oneself. Socrates replies to this by saying, you're right. In many cases, uh, we might say an unjust individual has profited uh, through stealing and other, other means. But what actually enables, if your concern is wealth, what actually enables the accumulation of wealth? It has to be someone who it, thinks well, someone who's able to calculate, someone who's able to manage themselves as an individual well. What is required for one to think well? for one to be smart in their actions, so to have these kinds of virtues. And Socrates says it's going to be a soul that is harmonious, one that isn't burdened, because when one is burdened, for example, of being caught, they're likely to act rash, for example. They're not likely to actually obtain the objects that they pursue. Instead, it is the just person who is best equipped to excel in whatever area it is that they're interested in because their soul is in harmony. They're at ease and they're best able to focus on the object at hand. So for this reason, it is more profitable to live the just life than the unjust life. Now, Thrasymachus says, all right, Socrates, you've convinced me. And interestingly enough, you know, Thrasymachus actually sticks around for the entire dialogue but he doesn't say anything anymore. He listens to what Socrates says throughout the rest of the Republic. Many people, though, think that Socrates has not actually given the best argument against uh, Thrasymachus. Let's say that's the case. Why would Plato write Socrates giving maybe a weaker argument against what Thrasymachus is doing here? Is it that 
Socrates is trying to argue for some one individual who he might be appealing to? Is there some other reason? Or maybe those people are wrong. I mean, it is up for debate. Do you think that Socrates has successfully made the case that the profitability uh, 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 or, or that the, the one who lives the just life lives the more profitable life?